in the room. My name is Eric Lati. We have CT Muga Nduoko. Our guest host this morning is Wajiro Gekonyo, the executive director of the Institute for Social Accountability. And you're now joined by our guest for this next hour, who is Ambassador Dr. Ralph Heckner, the ambassador of Switzerland to the Republic. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. Well, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you. And I have to say, uh, it's first time with you. And it's a very cool ambiance <laughs> here in your uh, radio room. Right. Uh, just for our listeners, I think it is uh, below zero <laughs> in this uh, room here. A very Swiss temperatures. It's, it's because we've put you in the hot seat, uh, Ambassador. <laughs> Let's see. So we wanted to ensure that, uh, well, first of all, we make the, the, you know, the temperature conducive so that you can absorb uh, the heat. <laughs> you heard what we I were ready. discussing in the last hour. <laughs> we were talking about devolution in Kenya. Now uh, we, we know that we'd like to get a lot of lessons. And when Jiro Ikonyo was giving us some of the uh, you know, stuff that uh, devolution is happening in mm. Uh, how devolution is happening in Switzerland. Just give us the examples of how does how does Switzerland actually deploy its devol devolution? Well, um, devolution was uh, bottom up uh, developed in Switzerland. Uh, we had about two dozen uh, cantons, counties, and they joined forces, and that was in the 19th century. So um, the federal state was created bottom up compared to Kenya, where you had a top-down mm. devolution approach. But how that was done is also very different from Kenya because it was done uh, through a civil war. The question whether Switzerland should be a more centralized or more federal devolved system and state was fought out in a war. That was in 1847. So here in Kenya, and then that is what impressed me when I, when I arrived here, um, devolution was done peacefully. The, the constitution of 2010 was put together in a peaceful way, mm -hmm. uh, done by, by Kenyan experts, not by foreign experts. And uh, especially also the implementation of devolution was done peacefully. And we are talking about maybe the most difficult and critical and delicate uh, political question a country and a people can uh, um, decide upon, and that is whether you have uh, a power sharing system, a resource sharing system, or a centralized power, and uh, no resource sharing between the center and, um, and the devolved function. So, um, very much impressed by what I see in Kenya when it comes to um, a peaceful process um, to devolve power uh, from 2010 up to 2020. Mm. Switzerland, of course, is, is uh, regarded as almost an absolute democracy and we've been agitating and asking ourselves the question yeah. how is it that the voice of the people can be yeah. heard and then that translated to changes in the government system how can that happen uh, that's a good question I, uh, we have quite a unique system where um, uh, we let our people participate in the political process mm. um, and that is being done twofold we call it not absolute democracy mm. we call it direct democracy because our people can directly vote not only uh, on politicians as Kenyans are doing in Kenya you you vote every five years uh, who should be the president the governor the, f the famous I see I think six pieces suit as yes. you call it yes. um, <laughs> we do that too in Switzerland um, we vote on on our um, uh, who we would like to see in our national parliament or in our cantonal parliaments but in addition to that we can vote on issues mm. Um, that is called a referendum or an initiative where the people of uh, Switzerland have to express an opinion on an issue. And I can maybe give you two examples of, of issues that um, we deal with. Mm -hmm. um, 25 years ago, I was asked together with the Swiss people whether we would like to go for a 20 billion investment in a new railway infrastructure in Switzerland. It was the question whether we would like to modernize our um, railway infrastructure structure through the Swiss Alps. Mm -hmm. So the question was, would you like to build or not the longest railway tunnel on this planet? Um, and the Swiss people said yes. So um, that tunnel exists today. It's running and functioning. It's environmentally very sound. It is uh, also when it comes to the finances um, um, in a good shape. So the investment is, 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 it's a sound. Is, is a sound investment as well. So I feel that this is my tunnel. And I think that is very mm. important uh, when it comes to Switzerland. <laughs> you vote on a subject and then you own it. 
Mm. It is my tunnel. It is not the tunnel of the Swiss government. It mm. is the tunnel of all the people who voted for that tunnel. Or this year, I have to express uh, myself um, on pesticides and the use of pesticides in agriculture and the consequences for our drinking water. So the, the Swiss people on a, on a regular basis are, are asked to, to have a political opinion on sometimes very complicated issues. Mm -hmm. So you ask how we, we manage our direct democracy. I think the only way that you can manage a direct democracy is that you have citizens that feel fully responsible for what they are doing, mm -hmm. um, that they go to vote. And um, I just overheard the conversation um, before. Also, those who are not voting have an opinion. They are okay with whatever is being uh, decided for them. So you you have to have a you have as a Swiss citizens you have to follow politics. Mm -hmm. You have to be knowledgeable about what's going on in Switzerland. And um, is that deliberate policy to ensure that they keep up with? the processes of politics and development in the country? Yeah, it is our way to uh, have the Swiss people participate in the political mm. um, system. Mm. But um, it was also, it, it grew also historically. Mm. Between 1848 and 1874, Switzerland was a parliamentary um, it's a parliamentary, uh, system, a parliamentary yes. system like, mm. like Kenya. Mm. Um, and because one side won in the civil war, that side was running the show and felt that at a certain point, the people of Switzerland, especially those who had lost the war, the Catholics and the rural areas were getting unhappy and angry. So they introduced what is called a referendum mm -hmm. and afterwards an initiative. So you could challenge laws that were made in the Swiss parliament. And um, it took then another almost 20 years until the first uh, Catholic was uh, good enough to be member of the Swiss parliament, uh, the Swiss government. So it, it meant between 1848 and 1891, the, the one party ruled Switzerland opened up to the Swiss people, gave them the possibility to go for a referendum or an initiative and also opened up the political system, meaning we had at that time one out of seven members of the government who came from the so-called op opposition. Mm -hmm. So quite a journey, I have to say. Yeah, um, looking at, uh, based on your experience here, um, and of course Kenya is grappling with devolution, it's mm -hmm. new, what lessons are there? That uh, you know that we could mm. learn from, or that spring to your mind with regard to devolution in Switzerland and here, particularly the direct democracy, bottom-up yeah. sovereignty. You know those kind of things. Well, first and foremost, I w I would give the piece of advice not to copy paste a model from abroad. Mm -hmm. You can be inspired by what you see in this or that country uh, and how this or that. Um, system works, but um, uh, just to copy paste uh, what is being done in Switzerland will not work for Kenya. Uh, Kenya, like Switzerland, we both have our unique challenges and we need our homegrown solutions to that. For that reason, I, I found it interesting, uh, rightly so, that the Kenyan experts were writing the constitution in 2010. You did not fly in experts from all over the world um, uh, drafting a constitution for Kenya. But um, what can be done is definitely that we can um, exchange on what we see. I give you an example. Um, seven, eight years back, uh, Switzerland wanted to uh, assist Kenya in devolution, to make devolution work in, in Kenya. And um, the Swiss Development Agency started to do development projects in the northern counties. Why in the northern counties? Because our assessment was that that region was economically and also when it comes to the security quite fragile. And um, we wanted to, to um, yeah, give the northern counties also a chance to have a voice in a devolved system. So we brought um, the governors of the northern counties to Switzerland so that they see how cantons in Switzerland are working together. And um, 
We also put them in a in a in a hotel during uh, some rainy days, and uh, they sat together and hammered out what they, as governors from the northern counties, would have in common and uh, could share as strategic objectives for their first four or five years as governors. Um, so that's that's how we work. You uh, have a look what we are doing, and then adapt it to to um, what. Uh, uh, your reality is because uh, Kenyans know best what is good for Kenyans. Mm. So today, when it comes to the frontier count, to the northern counties, there is um, a block that is called Frontier Counties Development Council (FCDC). It's not mm. ACDC. It's not a band. It's FCDC, <laughs> <laughs> and it is a lobbying club. It is. Uh, it is. Uh, uh, a group of governors that can lobby the central government. And, and that is important in a devolved system too. Your voice as a governor or as a region has to be heard. So that's maybe be an example how we try to exchange lessons, but uh, do not copy paste uh, systems. Um, you might get some good ideas. Yes, there's some definitely some good <laughs> leanings there because we're struggling a lot uh, with the concept of direct democracy and uh, we believe that's what was anticipated so but well noted yeah i mean direct direct democracy mm. exists in a way in the devolved functions because according to the constitution whatever a county is doing you should consult with your people mm -hmm. so how that is being done that is important it, it is this listening mode that the politicians have to be in as a as a um, official of Switzerland and working for the Swiss government, I always know what the Swiss people want me to do. Mm. It, is, it is a very comfortable situation because uh, on certain subjects, the Swiss people expressed an opinion, ha made a decision, and I implement that decision. So this, this, I do not feel detached from the Swiss people as a high-ranking official, and the same is true for politicians. Mm. And that is what consultation processes are all about. It's a beautiful model. We'll uh, talk about that more as we continue this conversation. Dr. Ralph Helkner is the ambassador of Switzerland to Kenya. Of course, we'll also be asking him to tell us how Switzerland is engaging with uh, countries within Africa, particularly in the region, East Africa, the East African community region, and addressing that perception, the global perception of Switzerland as a global financial haven. That's a question that we'll have to ask you and you know, tell us how also the, your government has been supporting us in our fight against corruption. What I hear the ambassador saying is that they have actually gotten the point of near perfection of the devolution, meaning they actually carry out the wishes of the people. Uh, the problem we seem to have in our country is that Leaders seem to think they know and understand the wishes of the people and everything they do is in the name of the people and for the people, even if it is their own wishes. Therein lies the disconnect. Because essentially, when leaders take the view that they know and understand, if, if, if you look at our entire thinking process and why devolution seems to be a problem is you want to get people to understand that the opinions they have because they have them matter and that they should be taken into consideration. But the practice of it is we wait for leaders to tell us what to do. Now, uh, at that rate, when you, do you really see us making progress? You know, City, <laughs> we agreed. It's not that we are waiting for leaders, but there's this, the relationship, our political culture is what needs work. And I think if we put it in the context of what the ambassador said and what we were discussing before, is the Constitution is our revolution. It's a revolutionary document and it requires activism to bring to the fore. But there are some aspects of that constitution that were muted uh, to accommodate the various interests. Mm. And those are the ones that we should be um, addressing because direct representation, bottom-up engagement, not only philosophically is it a challenge for our political leadership, but actually in implementation. Um, but I think if we went back to the Swiss, uh, you know, the Swiss example, um, there was a civil war, uh, and that's Rather how the negotiation take yes. place. Mm. And, and I think then people come out really appreciating what they, what, what they own. Um, so our role as civil society in defending this constitution really 
uh, I think this just uh, re-emphasizes mm. that we need to continue selling the constitution. We we don't have to go through a uh, violent conflict. Yeah, I but think, think we've had episodes. Mm. Yes, but we don't want to say that until more blood is shed. Having said that, we need to do what's necessary. Think about it. How is within the law? How is leadership perceived in this country? How do we perceive leadership? If you are to ask, it's problem it, solvers. Precisely, somebody servant leaders. No, as what they're supposed no. to. Be. How, how I always look them? at what what no. what we what aspire they ought to, to be you know, you know and what, what they are. What you know, you're in another class of citizen. Eh? Yeah. You you are more engaged. The ordinary citizen looks at leadership as problem solver. Yes. I have direct descendants from God. Yes. Yes. This is it. This is who I'm, I'm supposed to be. Right. Mm -hmm. When I have a problem, I go to you. <laughs> but I think with devolution, when it comes to the Kenyan citizens, mm. at least 20% of the budget, if not more, goes to the counties. So, In theory. But there goes money to the counties. Yes. So Again, in theory. <laughs> To the counties. City, money goes You're to the You're making life very difficult. No, no, no. Oh, no I'm not. I am merely stating the fact. But, uh, Your Excellency, please continue. Money goes to the counties. Yes, it, um, that it does. And is invested there. And yes. the people can assess what's being done with the, with the money. Yeah. Yes. So, two years ago, I, I toured all the northern counties and I was impressed to see that they were done, that the investments were done in healthcare, in schools, in roads, in markets, etc. So the people of Wajir can assess and could assess what was being done over the first four or five years of devolution under the first governor, for example. And they were also responsible to hold that governor responsible for what was being done. So it, it goes two ways. You need responsible politicians, but you need also responsible citizens. And maybe with devolution, that development of responsabilization of the Kenyan people has started. And when it comes to political leadership, I mean, there are some good governors in Kenya, and um, that might be the next crop for the national leadership. So. The, a devolved system is also a system where you can test ideas and test politicians in the counties. And uh, the Kenyan people see whether a governor is doing a good job or uh, not such a good job. Mm. I think the example you give of the northeastern, pro uh, well, former provinces of Kenya is actually real. But the other reality about the northern part of Kenya is that even at the point of devolution, they are next to nothing. So any sort of progress could easily be seen because it was the first time they were experiencing those things. These things that other parts of the country had taken for granted, they had never seen them. If you're talking about a tarmac road, you're talking about a certain level of uh, health care, you're talking about a, a water support. These things that many parts of the country had seen and taken for granted. So you see some money went to the counties. Yes. And you see it's, it's, it's my issue is with the percentage. <laughs> <laughs> and Something my, goes. My, yes, and my issue here is they are a perfect example, and Your Excellency, thank you, because it tells you what can be done if you actually get money going to places where it's needed. Mm -hmm. Now, imagine a situation where it actually got to do what it was supposed to do in the quantity it was said. A lot more would have been achieved. Yeah. That really sure. was my point. Yeah. Yes. I mean, I, yeah, I think that links us to the issue of corruption. Yes. Corruption is a, is a national problem. Yes. Um, it's a problem that has been incentivized in our political system and unfortunately has been, you know, socialized in, in, in the way we transact. And, and in fact, uh, if we were to unpack the Stockholm syndrome we were talking about, um, you know, some time back, um, citizens have come to expect favors from government because systems work so imperfectly. And so uh, this dependency has really been ingrained and, and it's a, we're in this vicious cycle. But there's, there's one aspect of that uh, which links to illicit financial flows. And, and now that we're moving into a global context, we've seen the impact of, um, you know, uh, high level borrowing by government, government being able to get into large contracts to then implement projects. And, and these proceeds are not always reaching 
the country. And, and of course, I want to bring the ambassador in here because mm. I know this is a question that's often asked to you um, because of um, Switzerland's status in terms as, as uh, you know, a financial uh, haven. Um, how, what, what, what measures are in place to help um, to deal with corruption? And, and do you think that uh, Switzerland's neutrality and, and financial status is used to really impoverish countries by uh, unscrupulous private enterprises working in cahoots with uh, governments? Uh, you know. No, thank you for this question. Mm -hmm. um, first and foremost, uh, what you see in James Bond movies isn't <laughs> true anymore. Uh, I like James Bond movies. My wife doesn't. Um, mm -hmm. But in James Bond movies, you normally see this supervillain uh, uh, who's putting the UK government under pressure and uh, threatens to destroy the United Kingdom and the world um, uh, for ransom money that is then be wired to a so secret numbered account. <laughs> account in Zurich. So um, this is this isn't the Swiss financial center today, full stop. And we have come a very long way. And let me explain you that a little bit. Today we have anti-money laundering laws mm -hmm. in place, which we hadn't a couple of years back. Mm -hmm. Today we have processes in place to fight the financing of terrorism. We have a long-standing history and policy to block and return assets from uh, crime and corruption to countries. We have also a prevention mechanism um, for so-called politically exposed persons, PEP. These are politicians, high-ranking officials. If you are a high-ranking official or a, or a politician um, abroad uh, and you would like to open a bank account in Switzerland, there are some uh, precautionary measures that uh, apply to you much more than for a normal client. Um, we have now a policy even that um, a client has to prove that the money that he's putting in a Swiss bank account has been taxed at home. And uh, something totally unheard of uh, 10, 30 years ago, mm -hmm. Switzerland is exchanging financial information with countries abroad. So when I started my, my diplomatic career in 1997, the main mission that was given to us young uh, diplomats was to defend Switzerland's banking secrecy. Mm -hmm. My mission today as ambassador of Switzerland to Kenya is to prevent illicit flows, to combat corruption and to work with, uh, with my host country to combat corruption. And I do that very thoroughly because Switzerland has to prove that the James Bond image isn't it's true normal. anymore. Mm -hmm. So the national interest is that we prove, that I prove as a Swiss ambassador to the Kenyan people, that we mean business when it comes to fighting corruption, when it comes to um, fighting illicit flows to Switzerland. So during the last years, I had uh, quite some important moments when it comes to the fight against corruption and our cooperation with Kenya. Um, I had the deputy prosecutor federal in town. I signed a MOU with uh, former Attorney General Githo Muigai. And that MOU was important and is important because for the first time, the Swiss and the Kenyan law enforcement agencies can contact each other directly. Normally this is being done via the diplomatic channel. So that means uh, a, a Kenyan DPP can call the prosecutor federal in Switzerland, discuss a case, and especially discuss how to write and frame a mutual legal assistance request to Switzerland so that Switzerland can agree to it and reply positively to mm -hmm. it. That is very important because you have the British jurisdiction and legal system and we have the French one. And last but not least, in 2018, the, the, the president of the Swiss Confederation visited Kenya. And the main point there was um, the, um, the signing of the a framework for the return of assets from crime and corruption to mm. Kenya. Mm -hmm. And that was a huge message to the Kenyan people. And the message arrived where I wanted uh, the message to be heard of uh, at, the, at the level of the Kenyan people. After the visit, I went to the... the National Zoo with a friend from Switzerland and I bumped into a Kenyan safari driver and 
when he learned that we were from Switzerland, said, "Oh, Switzerland, you're returning our you're money, returning our money. Yes. to us, the people." Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. Um, this is a huge change, and I would like to finish with that. This is a huge change. Switzerland changed from here to there when it comes to how we did business as a financial center. And when it comes to Kenya, my message is if Switzerland can change from here to there, Kenya can change from here to there when it comes to corruption too, because it always needs two to tango to be corrupt, but also to not be corrupt. If we talk about money that, uh, well, let's talk about the agreement that the Swiss government had with the Kenyan government. Can I assume that some money was returned or is in the process of being returned back to the country? Let me sp start by the countries that are part of the framework agreement on the return of assets from crime and corruption to Kenya. Yes. Mm -hmm. This is Switzerland, this is UK and this is Jersey together with Kenya. Mm -hmm. And all the, the countries, Switzerland, UK and Jersey have a policy and a track record and a history of blocking and returning assets from crime and corruption to the countries and the people of the country of origin. Um, and all the three countries had or still have money blocked. And that was the reason why we joined forces, UK, Jersey, Switzerland, and Kenya. And the framework is an, a kind of agreement um, that puts in place a structure, how to deal with the return of money to the Kenyan people, and also the principles how that should be done. And there are two important principles there. First, the money goes back to the Kenyan people. And as a Swiss ambassador, I will make sure mm -hmm. that the money goes back to the Kenyan people and not into the pockets of a corrupt, uh, corrupted official or any other Kenyan. And the second principle is partnership. Uh, it means that Switzerland and Kenya have to come up with an agreement how to return the money. And I give you an example how this was done, uh, for example, with uh, Nigeria, because one of our journalists here is from Nigeria. <laughs> um, uh, uh, in the late 1990s, um, uh, General Abadja died, um, and uh, the Swiss government declared the um, uh, Nigerian government under Abacha a criminal organization and with mm. that was able to block all the money mm. that Abacha had siphoned from the oil revenue and from the Nigerian people. We found 700 million US, US dollars time. in Switzerland just from General Abacha. We are not talking about his son. Mm. Um, and that huge sum was uh, um, returned to the, kin, uh, to the um, uh, Nigerian. Nigerian people. Yeah. It was done through an agreement between Switzerland and uh, Nigeria, and it was done through development projects, which were then overseen by the World Bank. So you had a triangle. You had an agreement of um, two governments and the World Bank overlooking the implementation of the development project so that the money that was stolen from Nigerian people was given back to the Nigerian people. So when it comes to VRAC, that's exactly how it will be done. So it's calling for accountability. I have some questions when I hear that, when I hear that, uh, you know, the money will come back, but it has to be implemented through some, uh, somebody else and oversight by somebody else, instead of it just coming to a national treasury where we can steal it again, or we can put it to better use or other use which the people of Kenya decide to use. Let's take a short break, but Ambassador, we have in the studio Dr. Ralph Heckner, he's the ambassador of Switzerland to Kenya, and of course he's in the hot seat, he's been telling us the uh, work of the Switzerland government and the Kenyan government on that front. Uh, of course, looking at that, coming off of uh, uh, what Eric asked, why the, why the necessity to have then a third body to, to make sure that um, these funds are adequately used once there's a repatriation of the funds? Well, US President Reagan said, trust but verify, and that's exactly <laughs> what we do. Mm -hmm. You have to be sure that the funds returned reach the people of the country of origin. Mm -hmm. So um, a third party can be very helpful because uh, the, the World Bank, for example, has uh, the 
objective to do development. They know how to do development projects. And for that, ca for that reason, they were chosen to return the assets to, um, through projects in, in Nigeria. But that can be done also totally differently. For example, in the Philippines, um, the Marcos money was returned to victims of human rights abuses. Mm -hmm. And that was a very long process because um, you had to adapt the national legislation in the Philippines. You had to come up with uh, a list, a uh, verified list, audited list of uh, people who were victims of human rights abuses. And uh, the Marcos money then was returned to those uh, person it, persons identified. Mm -hmm. Mr. Ambassador, it sounds like one of the key partners, of course, in this is the country, would be Kenya. Yes. And I think the question City had asked is, um, how well have we utilized that agreement? Um, what funds have we successfully asked for, repatriated? Uh, the Anglo leasing had some money in the Swiss banks. I don't know whether that yeah. has, has come back. and. You know how what we want to know is how is our country doing and uh, yeah. yeah so uk has already returned assets uh from the chicken scandal Ch yeah Ch chicken, chicken, chicken gate, gate. gate. Yeah. scandal um based on the experience how that was done and uh, with the kenyan government the uk government approached us here uh, together with jersey to uh, come up with the idea of um, hammering out a framework how this should be done. And the idea was to do it quickly and to do it in a more structured way. Now, Jersey is about to return uh, money. Uh, negotiations are going on um, and they are going on. And uh, uh, Switzerland has blocked two million US dollars uh, when it comes to Anglo leasing. So this is a small amount of money compared to what we were talking about in Nigeria. Mm. But returning $2 million would be a huge political message. Um, thanks to our mutual legal assistance, the, um, the Anglo leasing cases in the courts of Kenya. So I cannot say how long that will take. And I cannot go into the details of uh, what is going on in the, in the Kenyan courts. But um, it shows that we are moving forward, but it also shows how long it takes to um, move forward and then wrap up um, such a corruption case. But with FRAC, and that I think is the good news, we are ready to um, then quickly return our assets to the Kenyan people. So FRAC is, is a kind of uh, a preparation um, uh, thanks to Vrek, we are prepared mm. well to mm. do that quickly. Is this for the long haul, Dr. Heckner? What, what do you is mean? It, I mean, in terms of this is help, that is, it's help that's coming to countries mm -hmm. across the continent. Is this partnership or things that we see for the long haul in terms of policy of the Swiss government um, with partnership with yes. African countries? Absolutely. I mean, our policy to block and return assets has now uh, a history of almost 30 years. Mm. And when it comes to Kenya, how we, Jersey uh, and UK are returning assets to Kenya and how this is done with Kenya, mm. we, we can write a new chapter in that history. If that is done thoroughly, if this is done intelligently, um, creatively, quickly, etc., in partnership, um, we can add to best practices how that can be done. Mm. I'm talking about three countries that have a track record to return assets. Right. Mm. There are other countries that just take the blocked assets and put them in their own treasury department and then they are building roads mm -hmm. um, on the North Af uh, American continent, mm -hmm. for example. Mm -hmm. So um, it could also be a, a way to interest other countries to do the same, to come up with a asset return policy. Mm. Um, it's not enough to block assets in mm -hmm. your jurisdiction. You have to go the extra mile. It has to be repatriated to the people of the country of origin. So um, I hope that FRAC uh, will have many more countries uh, joining uh, um, uh, countries that have money mm -hmm. blocked from uh, crime and corruption in Kenya. I want to move away from corruption a little bit. <coughs> well, not a little bit, a lot bit. Uh, <laughs> the Uteli College 
stands out as one of the most significant development assistance projects that this country has ever received. And it came from Switzerland. What other development projects is Switzerland involved in in the country currently? As I said, today we focus on the northern counties. Um, in, the, in the northern counties, we support the pastoralist community because the, the needs in the northern counties when it comes to the people are linked to the pastoralist community. So we invest in water management because the, the, the animals need water, mm -hmm. the pastoralists need water. We invest in um, livestock management. You have to be able to manage your cows and goats in a, in, a, in a way that you can also make money and that it is sustainable. We invest in health, the health of the pastoralists, but also in the health of um, the animals they have. And as I said, we invest in um, making devolution work for the northern counties through the Frontier Counties Development Council. And um, this, this has been done together with other agencies, uh, other countries and development agencies, but this is also done with the private sector. So when it comes to uh, water management, we, we try to, to, to work with um, uh, not only other development agencies, but we try to bring in the private sector as well. So specifically, if you're talking about water, what do you do? Dig boreholes? Uh, create? What do you do? And in, with health, what exactly do you do? Invite my head of corporation and he will be much more <laughs> knowledgeable <laughs> than me. <laughs> you see, why I ask is because the government through devolution and even through just the national effort also lays claim to ensuring that development reaches these areas. What I'm actually asking for, how do you distinguish the two? Or do you work in cooperation with the government so that the government efforts yes. also incorporate your effort? Now you give me an, a question that I can answer. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we work with the county administrations. Mm -hmm. For example, when it comes to livestock ma man, uh, management, we work with the different, uh, what is it called, CCs? Mm -hmm. of the CCs, yes. Of the, of the counties that mm -hmm. are dealing with livestock. Mm -hmm. um, we bring them together so that they have one livestock policy and we link them with the, the, the CECs for health mm -hmm. of the region as well. So we don't do that without the county governments because otherwise it would be a futile exercise. It has been owned by the county administrations at the end. And um, for that reason, we did not only work with the governors because the governors can be voted out and quite a lot of Kenyan governors are normally voted out by the mm -hmm. Kenyan people. Mm -hmm. So for that reason, we put a second layer in our cooperation efforts and that was with the administration of the counties, uh, the CACs dealing with livestock health, etc. Yeah, yeah. Mr. Ambassador, there's also an uh, interest uh, in TIVET yes. on, on your part. Um, and, and f you know, could you explain why and what opportunities you see in Kenya? No, thank you for this question. Um, you know, the, let me maybe explain a little bit the Swiss system so you understand where, where I would like to, to go to and where I come from. 70% of the Swiss young pupils at school go into Tibet. Only between 20 and 30% are going for a high university degree. Mm. And the Swiss parents are pushing their children to go into Tibet. That is a, a big um, uh, difference when it comes to Kenya. Mm. Because I had, I had conversations um, with Kenyan parents, but also youngsters who said, well, I'm a failure. I, I can't go to university. Now I go for Tibet. Mm. Yeah. Uh, well, in Switzerland, you don't feel that you are a failure if you go for Tibet. Mm. Um, Seventy percent, as I said, of the young Swiss go for Tibet, mm -hmm. and there's lots of money to be made in Tibet uh, as well. I can I can elaborate on that too. So that is the first point. You need a mindset of the people that Tibet is something positive to go for, and a second point is you need a good cooperation between the government and the private sector. In Switzerland, the government provides for a good education and for Tibet institutions. But the private sector has specific jobs, 
first time job opportunities for young Swiss. So if you want to be an electrician, for example, um, the, the, the head of the company that is uh, uh, having electricians and is doing uh, electric robots all over Switzerland mm -hmm. um, has specific on the job training positions for mm. youngsters. Mm. They earn a little bit less than they would as a real and well educated and trained electrician. But at the age of 16, if you earn, I don't know, maybe 1000 Swiss francs, even in Switzerland, this is nice money. Mm -hmm. All my ch all my colleagues who went for Tivet at the age of 18 had a car, um, mm -hmm. a new one. I had a second hand car <laughs> at the age of 30. <laughs> so um, um, what what is needed is the private sector stepping up to the plate. And I can give you an example how important the private sector is for Tibet. There's a Swiss business here, it's called Bühler. Mm -hmm. They produce uh, high-tech mills. So the chapati that you're eating, uh, that flour is normally milled, or there's a high chance that that flour has been milled by, grained by um, Bühler mills. Mm -hmm. um, but they invested in an African milling school here because what they saw is there's a need of high qualified millers hmm. to operate their high tech mills. Yes. And a Swiss company turned Kenya into a hub for TVET for millers. On the African continent, Middle East and Pakistan. So here in Thika, you have people from Nigeria, from Pakistan, Rwanda, Kisumu, um, the, the United Arab uh, Emirates, Emirates etc., all training to turn into a more professional miller. And they are all sent, and that is also a little bit the Swiss system here, mm. they were all sent from their, the, the owners of their mills. So, for example, the owner of a mill in Kisumu has chosen one, two or three of his millers to go for to for training. And um, the in return of investment will be that they are able to operate the mills better, mm -hmm. uh, maybe having a better flower at the end of the whole process, making more money uh, thanks to that. So this shows you how important the private sector is. And mm -hmm. here in Kenya, I think the private sector can do much, much more. Much more. Mm. Have we made, has, has in Kenya, can you see that the connection has been made then with what Tivets would be able to do for the general population in the future? And that's a very good question. But Ambassador, before you get there, let's take a short break at 10 minutes to nine. And uh, we'll come back and Dr. Heckner will answer this question. And of course, now we are discussing Tivets and it's very interesting to hear that, uh, you know, the example of Switzerland, again, devolution. Now you're going to Tivet. We, we can borrow a lot from Switzerland. This is the situation of Miss Kenya's biggest conversation. Can you see that the connection has been made between Tibet and their importance and what they can do, really? I think what has been done is um, by the government to come up with a new Tibet policy mm. and also to put more emphasis on Tibet institutions. Um, so the link now from that government Tibet policy to the private sector is important. Mm -hmm. And it is very important because in Switzerland, the private sector is also influencing the curricula of the Tibet institutions. Mm -hmm. So at this point, I think it would be important that the, the Kenyan businesses are jump on that opportunity mm -hmm. of a, a newly defined Tibet policy, mm -hmm. um, provide uh, first job opportunities to young Kenyans, uh, aim for um, quality welders, quality uh, electricians, because um, if you have a look at, at Kenya and the wider region, there's a growing middle class in Kenya. Mm -hmm. They all need furniture. They want to have a house, so they better uh, have, a, have a, a good roof and mm -hmm. a good plumbing system and a good electri electrical system. Um, and even in the region, the whole Eastern African community here um, is a huge opportunity for uh, growth mm -hmm. in general and is a, a huge opportunity to serve a growing middle class. So if Kenya is coming up with a, with a good TVET system, government is doing its job, the 
businesses are opening up to young Kenyans mm. and the young Kenyans are going into Tibet, you can rule the economy of the East African communities. Mm -hmm. A Kenyan electrician will run uh, the best um, business in Rwanda or the best business in Tanzania. Mm -hmm. So um, it's, it, is, it is huge what you can uh, uh, gain also uh, through Tibet. I, I mean, I had a conversation with one of my best friends in the foreign service who is now our ambassador to Chile. Mm -hmm. And he, he told me that one of his schoolmates um, who went for Tibet is a very successful businessman today. He has a medium-sized uh, enterprise, dozens of uh, employees, and he's making much more money than uh, my colleague and myself uh, combined together. Mm. So he made it. He's uh, making more money than us, mm. and he's creating jobs. I'm not creating <laughs> private sector jobs yeah. as an ambassador. Mm. Yeah. Mm. When I hear what the private sector is doing, uh, I'm just hearing a word that may come back from the private sector, incentives incentivize them so that they can you know give those first time jobs to the young graduates from tibets does this happen in uh, switzerland that the private sector for example is being incentivized by the government to absorb uh, the graduates of tibets the yes but it is also in the interest of the business itself so if you are a highly qualified um, furniture making business you do not want to have a, a, a shady um, competition when it comes to furniture making. What you would like to have is a highly qualified furniture maker right next door to you and competing on quality. Mm. So that is the incentive. The incentive of the private sector is to keep a high level of quality when it comes to what you provide as a, as a business. Mm. But TVET is a way of keeping a high level of competition and a, and a level playing field when, uh, if you want so. And for Kenya and Kenyan businesses, the mm. question is, um, do you want to have, I don't know, Italian furniture makers making the furniture for the Kenyan middle class or do you want to do that? Because the Kenyan middle class wants to, wants to have a certain standard. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if that is your, your market, you better start uh, working on Tibet. So, mm -hmm. um, uh, and you can produce your own furniture makers through Tibet opportunities in your, in your company. Mr. Ambassador, I think that's uh, such a powerful vision. And I think just linking to the question that uh, you raised, Eric, um, we, we actually have a deficit of plumbers, of, of technical workers, yep. um, especially plumbing, electricians. We don't have that. And so we do need the uh, Tibet. There is the policy. Unfortunately, government in the present budget, I, I think also last year's budget, has defunded Tibet. Uh, because of debt commitments. So it's back to the same issue about um, the fight against corruption. It's one thing to have development partners who create frameworks and are willing to cooperate and assist uh, government. But it still comes back to us to ensure that our court are able to litigate and conclude corruption cases like Chicken Gate. Uh, that case was concluded um, in the UK, I think in uh, 2015, uh, whoever was, you know, the, the guilty were charged and have been released while yep. we still haven't, we were unable to conclude. Um, so similar to Tibet, we have a huge burgeoning youth unemployment. We've got huge uh, number of young people going into informal sector who would benefit from going through Tibet. Mm. But then government won't fund this because the political decisions are, are, link, are aligned towards large infrastructure projects that have big mm. procurement. So at the end of the day, we can't escape political leadership accountability. And I think- The bottom line. It is the bottom line. And as, as Kenyans, as civil society, as media, as Kenyans, this is the question we have to raise to government. So we have development partners willing to work with government, mm. but our political leaders have to uh, put the money where it makes the most impact. Well, I think it's not development partners. I see Switzerland as uh, a partner when it comes to business. What Kenyans need are jobs, exactly what you said. And TVET is a way of creating jobs. And um, 
my mission as an ambassador here is also to attract investors mm. from Switzerland and investments from Switzerland to Kenya. So I had three investors group visiting Kenya last year. But sometimes I have the impression that politicians don't know how to create jobs. The way to create jobs is TVET. Mm -hmm. And uh, you need three to tango. You need the Kenyan youth that goes for TVET, as I said. You need a good funded, well funded and well thought through TVET policy by the government and the private sector together. So these three have to come together. Mm -hmm. And if I see the Kenyan youth, I they're think they're a little bit they're upset. Mm. They're a little bit upset yeah. about, their, uh, about their situation, yeah. maybe even angry. So yeah. you better focus on jobs for the youth. But okay. Ambassador, we want to thank you very much for coming to visit us this morning. And we'll invite you again so uh, we can have <laughs> more conversations on this. Uh, I hope pleasure. you've enjoyed the hot seat. It wasn't as hot as uh, you thought. The heat is, is up now. It's not as cold as it was when you started the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely true. <laughs> <laughs> so we just want you to give a message to the Kenyan people as uh, the government of Switzerland. Well, my message to the Kenyan people is that um, I'm very positive when it comes to Kenya. I'm mindful of the fact that especially these days, this, are, this is a tough moment for, for, the, for the global economy and, 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 and the world at, at large. But um, I have been here in Kenya and I saw and felt how Kenya moved forward. This is a country that moves forward. And um, this is a country that has the potential to move forward like a rocket. Um, if I have investors from Switzerland that are flabbergasted by what they see when it comes to fintech in, in Kenya, if I have a Swiss, a Swiss pilot with an with a, with a airline here in, in Kenya who is telling me how much infrastructure development he has seen just over the last couple of years just flying over Kenya, you, you have to be and you can be positive. Mm. So um, I will leave Kenya uh, around July and I'm sure observing Kenya from a distance, I will see Kenya moving forward and uh, at a certain point, Kenya will move forward like a rocket with this strategic position that you have be between Asia and Central Africa. Um, the best is yet to come. Again, uh, Ronald Reagan, although uh, there are other US presidents in the history too. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Ralph Heckner, the Swiss ambassador to Kenya, ending on a very positive note. And on that positive note, we'd also want you to hear an African proverb from C.T. Muga. <laughs> Every lizard lies on their belly. We cannot tell which has a belly ache. Did you get that, Dr. Heckner? <laughs> <laughs> Every uh, lizard. I'm, I'm not yet that Kenyan, <laughs> although I stayed well, <laughs> five years. Uh, so. <laughs> simply put, appearances can be deceptive. Okay, yeah, mm. Mm. I agree. <laughs> Every lizard lies on its stomach, on its belly. We cannot tell which has a bellyache. Yes. Mm.